In history, there's a figure so enigmatic, shrouded in secrets and scandals, that he continues to baffle the world today. From humble origins to Russian royalty, he defied convention, and his reputation for debauchery and influence spread far and wide. Today, we continue our Persons of Intrigue month as we dissect the captivating saga and mysteries of the infamous Rasputin. This is Red Web. Welcome back, Red Web Task Force members all across the world. We are continuing our Mysterious Persons Month here in August. It is hot out, so I figured, why not bring the hot and sultry, I should just say lusting, Rasputin to the table. I'm your resident mystery enthusiast, and joining me hearing about these conspiracies, mysteries, and theories, all for the very first time, Alfredo Diaz. I've heard the name Rasputin. I have no idea... A, like of anything of really? this person, yeah. Surprisingly enough, um, where I heard it the most, Destiny, the video the game? game. Yeah, you that's... haven't seen Anastasia the movie. I mean, who was really watching Anastasia uh, over like me and my brother every day? But like over. Oh right, and by the way, I do want to call attention to this. Oh, it's yes. a rare occasion. Very rare. Jillian hasn't sat in on a recording in ages, so we got riding shotgun as the chair in the moment. Mm -hmm. Jillian, hi. What's up? Hello. You know. I watched that movie. He was scary. They they had some things oh, kind of accurate, and then too. some things were like shifted to make it child yeah. friendly, right? Yeah, less death. Well, it was kind of. There was some death. Her There's whole definitely family death, dies, but I mean, I guess then... on his behalf, like he stays around. Oh yeah, he gets banished rather than just yeah yeah. Bleh. And then there was the the sequel, Polar Bear Express. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Right. So anyway, we cracked open the movies <laughs> right away. Um, I was going to ask you, as I'd like to do, just to get your feeling, but it sounds like you don't know much about Rasputin. I don't know anything. You, you said monk, I went word. But with all the movie talk aside, you know, Task Force, I appreciate your patience. We are the movie podcast about mysteries, but yeah, we are. without further ado, I want to dive into this very interesting individual. Now, we're not going to have theories like Shakespeare. I'm not saying that this is potentially a different person. What we're going to address is the mysticism around Rasputin. There was a lot of prophecies made, a lot of magics and, and other religious elements around Rasputin that really garnered his image. And we're going to kind of walk through his background of his life and some of those prophecies and kind of come at the end to discuss those and what, what we think actually went down when kind of looking back with hindsight. But content warning, we've got topics featuring murder, death, self-harm, and sexual content. So let's dive in. Grigory Yefimovich Naivik was born January 22nd, 1869, in a small village called Pokrovsky in Siberia along the Tura River. This is the original name of the man that we know as Grigory Rasputin. We're going to talk a little bit about maybe where that name came from, but I need to say this at the very top. Records are scratching left and right. I mean, again, there's a lot lost to history, and sometimes the better story outpaces fact and vice versa. So we're going to see a lot of story and fact jockeying for attention here in this in this biography. Rasputin just is a powerful name. It's a powerful name. I just, someone's named Rasputin, I go, I don't know, they like royalty or something? Like, right. What's going on here? But I think because of this individual and, and the name he built for himself, I think that's what kind of carries a lot of that. Cause, True. Because, you know... It's because uh, he certainly had had that feel by the end of his life. And Siberia, just for what it's worth, is a very large region in the northern Russia area that stretches all the way from the Ural Mountains to the Pacific Ocean. It's, it is huge. Yeah. Yep. And it gets chilly. Yes, it does. There are very few records from Rasputin's childhood and early adulthood. But we do know that he came from a peasant family of farmers. And due to records of Rasputin being arrested for excessive drinking and theft, it is believed that he had a rebellious youth. Some sources claim that he was already being acknowledged by locals as someone with paranormal powers. For example, reportedly Rasputin could identify thieves and once correctly guessed who stole his father's horses. So immediately we start to see a trend of kind of what getting, maybe if you want to call it getting lucky, or at least just doing things that kind of made people raise their eyebrows like how did you, how did you know i mean or or, or it's, it's Jillian just... silently pointing to fredo because of the gut instinct yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah no, just, this, this and he makes likes the sense. name <gasps> alfredo rasputin uh -oh. i don't know i feel like maybe he kind of like 
yeah, he got lucky, or he knew and then didn't say he, he knew, and then it was like, oh, I'm going to take a guess. I'm just going to take a guess, but really he knew. You think he was a master of whispers? And Probably. And he's like, my little birds told me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also, like, if he was rebellious, I and mean, then I'm just, like, spitballing. If he's rebellious and maybe he kind of knows people that are a little bit, like, sure. on the other side of the law, and then from there people yeah, yeah, talk yeah. or snitch or whatever, then you know, and you take the information, don't say that you know, then you take a wild quote unquote guess and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden people are just like, whoa. Yeah. You're like, I know John's got a resume. Yeah. But Steve over here, he wouldn't steal horses. No. But yeah. Rasputin's education is also questionable and it is believed that he may have been illiterate until at least his early adulthood, which is going to be very interesting when we oh. start to kind of expand into his, his actual travelings, pilgrimages. Now, at some point, Rasputin had a religious awakening and became interested in the Russian Orthodox Church. Some sources say that this may be where he learned to read and write. In 1887, at the age of 19, he married 22-year-old Praskovia Dubrovina and had multiple children, actually had seven children, but unfortunately only three of them lived to adulthood. Mm, I mean, probably further back, people yeah. died to to Well, certainly... And yeah, being a, a farming family or a lower income yeah. family out in the middle of kind of rural Russia with yeah. medicine of the time, certainly. In 1892, he went on a pilgrimage to St. Nicholas Monastery in Verturia, which is about 500 kilometers or 310 miles from his village, though some sources claim that his pilgrimage actually occurred in 1897. These are all kind of details, but I wanted to at least be kind of open about some of those shifts. But here on this pilgrimage, he became interested in the Callisti sect. This was an underground spiritual Christian sect which split from the Russian Orthodox Church, rejecting priests and holy literature in place of direct connections with God. This involved rituals that included self-flagellation and group sex, among many other things. In fact, when I was looking up the pronunciation of the Callisti sect, it actually translates specifically to whips probably for the self-flagellation, which is kind of where you have like a Thinking. nine tails kind of thing. Some real kinky stuff. Kinky stuff and also just deeply religious stuff. Yeah. With history I'm not even going to go into. It's weird though. You normally don't see religion mixed with some real kinky stuff though. Well, you do. Well, do you? Well, not, not like, yeah, um, it's more like that is a kinky item that's been maybe co-opted by. Is religion group with group sex a lot? I, okay, you know, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I see the disconnect. I was I was caught on the whip. Oh, you know what yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. But you're right. Oh, no. yeah, whip religion. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I see what you're saying. Yeah, this is definitely an off split, an offshoot. And some people even saw this as anti-Christian. Just okay. like, like it was definitely an offshoot inspired by uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, if you will. But took a total turn. Oh, yeah, what weird to be like. I don't know. I guess a group of people were like, yeah, you know, we all met up at church, got together, and then kind of went, I don't know, what about we just all get together and yeah. make out? <laughs> Some people put their, you know, their their own desires into the religion, and that's where you start to hit maybe some cultish territory where you're uh, like, it's under the guise of an established religion, but it's actually yeah. more like, this seems kind of more self-fulfilling for whoever right. is kind of preaching it. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into it, but yeah, there's there's some elements that kind of make you raise an eyebrow or two. But with regards to this sect, there are some other sources that say that he was not a member of this sect at all, but was instead influenced by this sect since his views were kind of similar. And that seems to make a lot of sense. So now you have an offshoot of the Russian Orthodox Church, which then inspired him to kind of make an offshoot of even that. And that, and we're going to get there, and you're going to start to see how far away from the original church we were talking here. Jeez. Yeah. So you got like, so it's like, yeah, Vampire Diaries, that's the church. Then it spun off to Originals, <laughs> which was this this kind of cool thing. And then they took, and then it's like if they took the Originals and then spun that off, and that's yeah. what Rasputin did. Yeah. That's too many spinoffs, There's man. a lot of spinoffs. Jesus. You know, eventually you start to lose an ounce of the original piece. <laughs> right. The flavor's gone. Yeah. So this was kind of his first pilgrimage to the St. Nicholas Monastery. He then continued to make these religious journeys as a Stranic, or a wanderer slash pilgrim in English, to other holy places, including Greece and Jerusalem, both of which were about a 38-day walk from the village that he was both born and raised in. 38 days of walking, 
hundred kilometers. Jesus. A, it's a good distance. And he walked it? He's walking it. Like, yeah. I mean, if you just go from town to town, you're just a wandering soul at that yeah. point. And, and this is kind of where his riz is hitting Russians and, you know, all the people in the area because he's stopping by villages, talking them up, making a name for himself. That's the first time you use riz on this podcast. <laughs> riz Putin. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. okay, that's good. That's um, good. Also, that's 3,000 that miles. 3,000 miles. 3,000. Sorry, Europeans. We had to put it into our own, like, measured <laughs> yeah. off of some kind I just of had to make thing, sure. I like, didn't put it in. I was like... No, no, um, that's totally fine. I... I Both mean, of yeah, which I know I guess are big, you just but keep man. traveling and tell your own stories and tales and yeah. become this mysterious figure. Yeah. It's so interesting how this is someone that came from nothing and essentially just built themselves an empire. Yo, you, more than you know yet. But we're right, getting there. But, it, but it's just so like, I don't like, how do you even. Right. From such incredibly humble beginnings, this man rises his way to the top. Like how he does is that risen. Happen. Okay. By the way, that means charisma. Yes. I know my dad listens. <laughs> that's, for, that's for him and anyone else that doesn't get it. But, <laughs> but yeah, you're. I mean, you're totally right. It, yeah. and, and this is so. That's I think to me personally, mysticism aside, we're going to address all that. But to me, the fascinating story is, if nothing else, the practical story of how somebody went from rural peasant in in the Russian countryside to the very top. I mean, rubbing ears, if you will, with the Tsar and the Tsarina, right? Looks like a Boris, I would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Julian I mean, just he, flipped around an image of Rasputin, and he's, yeah. and he's giving a good glare. He's uh, giving a mean glare. He's got a gnarly, long, lumberjack-ish beard. Mm -hmm. His hair is gelled and kind of just flat and split down to the sides. It's thinning, too. And then too, he's kind of hench. Uh, he's... he's, he's Thick. Mm. I yeah. just wanted you to see like what he looked like, so he might have like people were kind of put under a spell by him, like specifically because of yeah, his how are you eyes. Feeling? I mean, drawn. It in? looks. Uh, I'm not drawn in. I'm kind of drawn away. <laughs> <laughs> like but he when, looks. He looks mean. But if you heard him speak, you'd be pulled right in, right into those possibly sultry black and white eyes. I don't know what I color think he his had eyes green are. eyes. I think. Oh wow. So he he was very unique looking. Yeah, that's what people. I just think. again, I just wouldn't. I'm still still baffled because like, you know, you'll you'll break it down. But as of right now, my mind is still at. I'm like, how do you make that? There's so many different leaps, mm -hmm. and so many yeah. people, different people you have to meet. How do you get yourself into that? S those circles, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, how do you get in? Oh to yeah, those those, uh, those doors. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Once we finish laying the groundwork of kind of his background, we'll absolutely dive into just how he made that leap. And it's it's interesting. And also, on his behalf, fortuitous to, to fortuitously grab a few rungs of that ladder and take advantage. Yeah, if you pardon my French, he was fortuitous enough <laughs> to... <laughs> so despite Rasputin's absence from home... While he's on these journeys, his wife and his children remained home in Pokrovsky. Sometimes these journeys would be months, other times he would be absent for years. Either way, the family continued on strong there in the town. He was able to continue these pilgrimages through donations from the followers that he had amassed along the way, many of them women, some of whom he was actually physically involved with. So you can see now how this these man is wild snowballing. He's out here crowdfunding his journey. Yeah. From like strangers. This guy has so much charisma. I'm telling you. This ya. is insane. So with regards to the Rasputin part, I do want to dive into that. And it's perfect because he is Rasputin, but even his name has been debated. Many sources say that he gained the surname Rasputin for his unruly behavior, which we've kind of talked about now, with it meaning the debauched one. But historians say that there's something a little bit more simple here, that it means, quote, where two rivers meet, which does accurately describe where he was born. He was also called the Mad Monk, despite not having been ordained. I think it was more of a nickname rather than actually him being a monk of some kind. Oh, damn. Okay, because I was like, oh, he's a monk? Yeah. yeah. Maybe self-proclaimed, but... Also, man, there's a name for everything. Two rivers that meet has a name. Yeah, I guess I so. Like, that's a river. Meeting another river. I'd be like, that's a fork. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That has a name. Connecting rivers. Boom. I guess it is weird because when you look at a fork itself, it's like a couple of prongs meeting one body. Is that does that have anything to do with rivers, or are rivers named after utensils? Oh. 
I'll yeah. leave that for the task force. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> was the thing. chicken before the egg? <laughs> right. or, a mystery uh, best served by the task force. I also want to point out that at the monastery, there there were monks. So like, Got it. So he, that's kind of how... So he wasn't officially ordained, but he was bumping shoulders with, yeah, like, yeah. with yeah, actual monks. He was bumping okay. shoulders with everybody. Right. He's lipping to ears and he's rubbing yeah. shoulders. And I think he's rubbing elbows, but he's a tall man. That's true. He uses yeah, shoulders. Rubbing elbows. So... With regards to these actual monks, Rasputin differed from them in the sense that he came up with his own set of values. He believed that, quote, holy passionlessness was the only way to get close to God, essentially saying sexual exhaustion. Basically, he's saying, I need to rid myself of any physical wants by way of exploring myself sexually with as many people as possible to the point where I don't want that anymore, at which point I can then finally be open to the holy entity. I feel like this man just wanted to be a player, cheat on his wife, and then just create a, all this BS mm -hmm. in order to do such a yes. thing. Loud and clear. Physical exhaustion. Sexual. Oh, sexual right. exhaustion. Not, not, it's not pumping lead and banging and slanging weights. It's right. pumping I, lead. Hold on. It, it, <laughs> it, <laughs> he got, well, he likes heavier weights than iron. He, you know, too light. But, but I yeah, mean, I feel you're right. I just... Okay, I know no, I knew nothing about this person. Now it, he's starting some kind of following where you have to, it's like sexually exhaust yourself. Mm -hmm. He's got people paying for all of his stuff. Yeah. Like, I just, do we have, is there any recordings or tapes of this man talking? Oh, that's a great question. That's a very good question. Let me look that up. Yeah. Let me look that is up. this man just the most like charismatic right. speaker? I mean, he, he wasn't educated. Um, he didn't know how to, he was illiterate until what his earlier teens. until until his involvement with the church. Yeah, and again, this is how what scholars believe right, connecting right, yeah, some yeah, dots. Yeah. But yes, I'm just like, what is this man saying? Yeah, I don't think there's any. I think it's too early. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to double check because I was like, man, I don't know. Maybe this man just sounds like the most like intelligent, charismatic dude on yeah. the planet. And you know how so, so some people talk and you just get like engulfed. Right, you're into, you're invested. You're so invested. Yeah. You're locked in. Mm -hmm. I was like, maybe, maybe this is that's him. He like, must have had a presence I would, for yeah, sure. I would say so yeah. And I think if he had a long, you know, robe or dress and he was hoverboarding around, the presence is made, floating around yeah, from person to person. Yeah, dominance. I'm very curious, actually, when the first audio recording was. I got to believe it was in this time period, but it would be such a niche item yeah. that, no, it wouldn't make it over here. Uh, 1860. Okay. So we're in the realm. You know, this is, a, this is not mass adoption yet, but, you know, we're in the realm. But that makes sense. So to further your point, Alfredo, Rasputin maintained his marriage to his wife, even though all the other monks would have left their families behind. So... Not only did he want to maintain his, his marriage and continue doing things that just the normal monks were not doing, on top of that, yes, he was also talking up a bunch of other women. I mean, who knows if we know this is a questionnaire. Did his wife know about all this sexual adventures? I feel like word would have gotten around. And so that's why it was kind of a, oh, well, it's my religion sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, he was known even by people in his town by then, like, they knew what yeah. he was like, but... I mean, she had to have known then. Yeah. I think so. Well, in addition to these other shifts in values next to the other monks, he also claimed himself to be a healer and that he had the ability to see the future. We'll talk more about his future sight later on when we talk about some of his prophecies, but this begins the more, if you will, outlandish tale that is Rasputin. Moving on now from his earthly desires, we're talking about unique abilities that are beyond our normal physical realm. Rasputin, as we now at this point know, was extremely charismatic, yet he also behaved in many ways that people would have considered impolite. He was known to speak loudly, drink alcohol excessively, and eat messily. Often his beard would be covered in food that he had eaten in previous days. Ill days? Yeah, dude. <laughs> That's gross. Anyway, give us a kiss. Yeah. Right? Like... Ugh. As mentioned before, Rasputin openly displayed affection towards women who followed him. Some say that he also stole things. So if he's openly displaying these relationships and it's part of his religion, to answer your question, I would assume that, yes, his wife must have known. Kind of making like a little cult here. Where yes. Where you just, I don't know, sleep with people that join. And, and do then, you think maybe then some people are either looking for his healing powers or looking for his soothsaying or looking for something 
and then he's just kind of. It's probably just people that want a that. purpose, to be honest. Could be. That's what I'm thinking. Absolutely. And then from there, once they find a purpose, they kind of just feel connected and safe. And then they're willing to do stuff to stay in that safety. So. No, absolutely. I, I feel like that it's uh, 100% makes sense. It's very much human nature, but also, again, speaking ignorantly here, but th these are things that you see oftentimes when speaking generally about cults. But moving on now to talk about his rise as a mystic. Eventually, Rasputin gained notoriety beyond Siberia into the rest of Russia. Word of mouth spreads quickly when you're this type of atypical priest. Not only that, but he's also walking around the country on these vast voyages, kind of talking himself up. It's important to note that at this time, Russia was also going through a period of political unrest. And so you're going to see, and I'm going to start to lay and sow the seeds of perfect timing that Rasputin either just kind of knew to took advantage of or lucked into. But much of the country was starving or living in poverty due to food shortages, and the royal family, the Romanovs, were losing political power. On top of these issues, interest in occultism was actually growing, particularly in the capital where Rasputin had been, St. Petersburg. In 1903, Rasputin ended up in St. Petersburg during one of his many wanderings. Stories of his debauchery and charisma had spread to the Roman Orthodox leaders and the Romanovs, who were very interested in mysticism in general. They had previously sought advice from multiple mystic people. In fact, Rasputin was introduced to both the Tsar and the Tsarina, Nicholas II and Alexandra, in November of 1905. I believe, Jillian, that they had put word out that they had heard of him and telegraphed him to try to bring him in because along with their interest, and we're going to get to it, but one of their sons had an illness that they were hoping right. to address. Hold on one sec. I'm just going to confirm. I'm curious, like, was it them hearing about him first or vice versa, I guess? He was introduced to them. So I, I believe they were already interested and the Orthodox Church was aware of him. Got it. So the leaders of the Orthodox Church knew about their interest in mysticism mm -hmm. and also knew this guy, kind of put it all together. Yeah, I think Interesting. so. Interesting. Well, in October of 1906, Nicholas II actually wrote to his minister with this to say, quote, A few days ago, I received a peasant from the Tobolsk district, Grigory Rasputin, who brought me an icon of St. Simon Verhatoria. He made a remarkably strong impression both on Her Majesty and on myself, so that instead of five minutes, our conversation went on for more than an hour. So this was like a year later after having met basically the Tsar, the leader of the, of the country. Rasputin not only got a five-minute window to meet with the leadership, but then also spent over an hour just chatting them up, getting them on his side. So this is like somehow he made a swing from the Orthodox Church right to the top. This is just the most... Person, like, uh, is this like the, the coolest person on the planet or something? <laughs> right. Because everyone this person comes across, like, they just, they're sucked in. Do you think he had, like, sleight of hand tricks where he, like, or removed his thumb and went, woo, 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 woo. They're like, wow. And I like, like this This guy. is it. But, I mean, I don't know. Like, like imagine having a meeting with, uh, uh, for me, it would be, like, Obama. Right. right. The president, the, you know. Yeah, right, yeah. Obama's president, you had five minutes, all of a sudden you walk out and you go, we chatted up for an hour. Yeah. I'm like, damn, that's and, the president because you think about it. Yeah. They have so many other important things they got to do. Mm -hmm. I'm sure like everything is scheduled down to a T. Yeah. And so this person just go, no, 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 just throw that but away. But sir, you need to meet the prime minister of England right, right away. Like, things nah, are dire. Hold on up. a second. I'm talking to Diaz. Yeah. That's just, I don't even know how you do that. Right. When you say... Like, you must just hit it off right. completely. But this person's hitting it off with everybody. Well, I think, to, to just to, to guess, I mean, his desire for attention and to say that, you know, he was a healer, that he could see the future, you know, he's essentially portraying himself as a mystic. And the whole country is not only on the upswing for occultism, but they are too. So he's kind of like, I hear you're interested in this. Let me tell you how much I know about that. And he's kind of just riffing maybe. Because they're just going, I don't know, we just need a healer kind of thing. That's true. I mean, also, though, they must know about everything else, like the sexual side of things. I guess I like, he heals and he gets it on. Ooh. But I really like the healing part I'm hearing you about. Think he, you think he left them with, like, position advice, you know, to help heal any sort of sure, marital woes? I'm sure they joked about it. I'm sure. You know? He's like, we're very comfortable with this guy. No yeah. one talks to us like this. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Ah. Uh. 
Well, suffice to say, the Romanovs were very impressed with what Rasputin had to say. In fact, they sought his advice on many things, which I don't know how you feel as Whoa. a Russian in the late 1800s and early 1900s, but I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Hmm. Like, if I'll be honest, I love you, man. But if you're talking to Obama and he's seeking your advice on international Another diplomacy, per, yeah. I'm going, well, step down, step down, my friend. Yeah. I don't know what you know, and don't, I don't, I couldn't do it. Don't get tangled up in that, making <laughs> big decisions. He's like, or Lumpia. influencing big decisions. He's like, Lumpia is now the official food of America. I'm like, okay, fine. I like that. That's fine. Like That's good that. advice. That's good. That's good stuff. Get G-Ma's, get G-Ma's yeah. recipe out there. Yep. I'm, I'm into that. <laughs> but beyond that, things get hairy. But most importantly, the Romanovs needed help with the health of their youngest child and their only son. He was heir to the throne, Alexei. So Alexei was born with hemophilia, a bleeding disorder where the blood doesn't clot properly. In 1907, actually, Alexei had a fall injuring his leg, and this was complicated by the hemophilia. And so this spurred the family, and he was only three years old, by the way. Oh, so this no. spurred the family to seeking help from any yeah, method any possible. Means, and then they get wind of this magical person. Yes. Normal doctors are coming through, prescribing medication. Nothing seems to be shifting or changing or getting better. And that's when Rasputin comes along. But I do want to say before we get to Rasputin, his case was so severe that I, just in case you don't know the extent of hemophilia, what it can do, his case was so severe that injuries such as common bruises, nosebleeds, things like that, could be life-threatening. So this is where the Romanovs are coming from. They are seeking desperately for any answers, and they're kind of in a vulnerable state. Asputin told his parents to cease any traditional medications that the doctors were providing, instead preferring to pray for the boy during his episodes. So whether through coincidence oh, or actual no. mysticism, Alexei appeared to heal from these prayers. Oh man, the luck on this man. Yeah. Here's actually what he said to Alexei in response to the leg injury. And again, remember, this is a three-year-old. And I'm going to throw a question out to precede this quote. But for a three-year-old, is there a placebo effect going on? Is this the role of authority? Or do you believe that this is some form of healing? So he says, Rasputin to the child says, quote, Your pain is going away. You will soon be well. You must thank God for healing you. And now go to sleep. Thereafter, the swelling did in fact seem to go down and the child seemed to be better. This solidified Rasputin as one of the most trusted individuals in the royal family, and during World War I, Rasputin was even giving the Tsar political advice. All the while, Rasputin continued the behavior that had earned him his name across the nation. Wild. This is... The luck, the, the timing, all of it. Oh yeah. And uh, I'm gonna spill some Rings of Power Season 2 juice. This okay. is like Sauron talking to Arpharazan, king of the Numenorians, mm -hmm. telling him to attack the undying lands. You don't let the wrong ones in and then let yeah. them start chattering at your ear. Yeah, we saw that. and Then you become a ring wraith. That's what happens. True. <laughs> True. But I haven't seen that. You haven't seen the Ring of Power? No. That's okay. You it's fine. ruined it. Well, that's not even in the show yet. Oh. That's just mm -hmm. oh. Silmarillion stuff. I don't know what you just said. Yeah. Half of me doesn't either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now you can see how these stories have really materialized into opportunity. And there's a well, few... Especially the luck you had with a child at that point. Like, that's the story that propels you mm -hmm. to, like, fame to the masses, oh, yeah. right? Like, you healed... Was it the president? Essentially, Essentially yeah. Essentially the, the president. The I don't know. The Tsar. Yeah, there you yeah. go. You healed the Tsar... The Tsar's sick child and and heir, only and son. Yeah, and heir. Like, come on, man. Like yeah. at that point, like you just hit the game winning shot for the country. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He like... put up the J. <laughs> How's it going, Task Force? Once again, it is that break in the mystery where I get to talk directly to your eardrums. As you might have known, you marked your calendars. I know you did. I heard you scratching and scratching. You brought your quill. And your ink out, and you said, I'm going to go to my calendar and mark it down because last week on August 4th, we released a bunch of new merchandise. We have our summer pin for both Squonk and Baby Hands. And we're also, I know, I'm not trying to freak you out or anything, but fall is approaching. And so if you want to get ready for those chilly and cold months to come, we have our new hoodie and jogger set available for you all at store.roosterteeth.com. But as always, if you want to support the show, with the freeness and the kindness of your heart, all you have to do is 
head over to whatever platform you listen to us on and review us or just simply share us with a friend of yours, somebody who loves mysteries and you want to join the task force so you can keep the conversation alive. However you want to do it, we greatly appreciate your support. And with that said, I have a few fantastic sponsors I want to talk about. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by Shady Rays. The sun's been brutal all summer, especially here down in Texas. I mean, it's getting to 105. It ain't no Death Valley, but man, does it sizzle. And that means we all need to protect our delicate little eyes when we go outside. And that's why Shady Rays has the gear we need as August hits. Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that knows just how to make top-notch products. The frames are built to be super durable, perfect for all your outdoor adventures, and the optics are crystal clear. Shady Rays also has a killer protection plan. Every pair comes with lost and broken replacements. So what does that mean? Task Force, let me break down that mystery very succinctly. If you accidentally lose or break your shades, even on day one, you're out there hunting for Bigfoot, they get trampled by his glorious toes, all you need to do is reach out to them and they'll hook you up with a brand new pair, no questions asked. That means you don't even have to prove that Bigfoot was there, okay? They just need to see that you shattered your glasses or whatever you did, you lost them perhaps, and they'll replace it, which is awesome. I really enjoy Shady Rays because of the plethora of styles they have. I've always talked about them. You know I like them, but every time I'm out there on my walks, on my runs, if I'm driving to the office and I want to look good, or if I just want to put on the Task Force style, cool, calm, collected, looking like a men in black. They've got a style no matter what my outfit is. And you know I've talked about it, but let me hit you again. I love polarized lenses. They're so good no matter what you're doing, especially if you're on the water and if you're near any windows or whatever and you're in the city, it gets rid of all that glare. So I really appreciate not only the styles, not only the quality, but also the optics. Exclusively Task Force, let me tell you what they got. Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. All you got to do is go to ShadyRays.com and use code REDWEB and you're going to get 50% off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses. Once again, ShadyRays.com and use promo code REDWEB. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 250,000 people. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by Rocket Money. Did you know that over 80% of people have subscriptions that they've completely forgotten about? Think about how many free trials that you've subscribed to and probably never really canceled. That's where Rocket Money can step in. It's the ultimate personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Rocket Money can cancel the subscriptions that you don't want with just the press of a button. They can even negotiate to lower your bills, saving you up to 20% which is, oh my God, so good. Just snap a picture of your bill and Rocket Money handles it. I really enjoy just how convenient they make it to kind of look at all your subscriptions. And if you want to cancel a service, like they say, you just go to them and they do all the handling. You don't have to deal with the rigmarole of ins and outs and trials and this and that. They handle it. And the fact that they can also help you with your bills and all of your credit cards all in one place, I love that. And Fredo also uses it. I know how much he really enjoys just how convenient it is to have it all in one convenient app. Stop wasting money on things that you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash red web. That's rocketmoney.com slash red web. And just in case you got that quill, that ink, you're writing it down with that little feather, making it look all good, rocketmoney.com slash red web. And with that said, let's get right back into the person of intrigue. So that's kind of how he rose to power now. And again, this is why I wanted to talk about such an interesting individual because with the backdrop of reality, you can start to see between the fantastic story threads, but also there are still elements, and we'll get to them, that are hard to explain. But despite his popularity with the royal family, Rasputin had many critics, and many were skeptical of his healing powers. There we go. I'm like, who, is no one questioning this it's man? It's not unanimous, yeah. Okay. Some thought that he was a danger to the country, and that he was corrupting the Romanovs. Rumors of his drinking, his wild behavior, bribing, heresy, his lust, all of these things filled the Russian newspapers. So at this point, it's like no news is bad news. At this point, it's just a tidal wave of getting his name out there. And so you can have an opinion left or right, but at this point, he's a household he's name. He's a household name. You know who he is. Yeah. Some called him a religious heretic, and his association with the Callisti sect was considered evil. We lightly spoke about this earlier. The public was shocked by his behavior and rumors began to spread that Rasputin was even having an affair with a Tsarina Alexandra. This added discourse because 
Alexandra was German, and if you know your history, Russia and Germany were enemies in World War I, which is fast approaching. We're in the early 1900s, we're within a decade of this war kicking off. But in fact, let's just dive into it, shall we? During World War I, Rasputin actually made a prediction that Russia would face some kind of tragedy. Long story short, this actually led to Tsar Nicholas II himself going to war in 1915. This then led Alexandra to be the one in charge of the country, which by the distributive property of humanity, I don't know, I don't know how else to say it, Rasputin essentially ruled Russia because he was so close with the Tsarina, he had her ear. And uh, that's just the two of them now. <sighs> this is a Lord of the Rings situation. It is. It's just whispering in the ear and you're controlling things. And, and when you think of, again, I'm gonna bring up another show, but like you think of Game of Thrones and you think of, okay, well, this is a fun show to indulge in. And yes, very fantastic, the storylines and the conflicts, but this kind of stuff happened. This is wild. Yeah. I feel like truth is stranger than fiction here. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, look, it's, you're in power. I can see people just be like, hey, you, you're thinking, you're, con I'm tired. I got yeah. working on all this stuff all day, every day, and you're sitting here with ideas and like, Great. I trust you. It's I don't worm see tongue it. Over I, here. Yeah, it's worm tongue. I don't see it as scheming. I just see it as helpful. Yeah. Ugh. It got to a point where other government officials are going, hey, Alexandra, I, I, we're a little concerned about what he might be putting into your ear. Let's maybe think about this. But, I mean, she vehemently defended him, like nonstop. She was on his side. He was on hers. Well, I mean, the foundation is he saved yeah. their child. Right. How strong a foundation can you build? get right. than that you right. know what i mean like you saved a loved one they're a, a, a mother's child yeah and then you just built off of that like mm -hmm. yeah, that man you're locked in she's seeing a man who came in and saved the son didn't ask for a thing but instead offered free advice she's like how could this go wrong yeah well yeah if the advice is on the behest of someone else and whatever they want you know that's a thing but there are many who wanted rasputin dead not only just removed from the presence of office but just gone. And he faced at least one assassination attempt, though I'm sure there are many. There's only one that we have documented. And this goes back to his hometown. In June 1914, there was a woman who stabbed Rasputin in the stomach and shouted, quote, I've killed the Antichrist. Jesus. So you can see just how split the political scene was, not only around him, but just in the country. He was badly injured, lost a lot of blood, but he recovered. Then two years later, there was a conspiracy once again to kill Rasputin, and that's where it at least began. The details are somewhat debated, and the closest thing to the truth comes from the memoirs of one of the co-conspirators, Felix Yusupov. So Yusupov was the husband of the Tsar's niece. To kind of give you a general idea, there is an upside to him wanting to go after Rasputin. It would kind of shake the royal family a little bit and maybe offer him an end to power. Mm -hmm. So there are some motivational factors but I'm sure there's at least an ounce of him just wanting this person out. December 29, 1916, Rasputin was actually invited to dine at Moika Palace under the pretext of meeting Yusupov's wife. This, again, is the niece or Princess Irina. She was actually away. She was not at all in the country, not at the palace or anywhere. She was actually in Crimea. Some sources do claim that Rasputin was aware of this plot to assassinate him, and it's likely he would have known Irina was away, so... We don't really know why he would have gone if right. he knew all of these things, but he did, regardless of any of that, he did agree to go to the palace. Yusupov showed Rasputin the basement where they planned to dine. Now, without Irina there, Yusupov and his co-conspirators made it seem like Irina had sudden guests and had to leave him behind in the basement. Reportedly, they even created a huge commotion upstairs to make it all seem real. So Rasputin is kind of sitting there in the basement waiting for the princess to come down. Being sold a lie. Being sold a lie. And there's a whole play, music number, everything yeah. going on upstairs. And so, you know, Yusupov comes back down and goes, I'm so sorry, Irina had to leave but please feel free, eat of the cakes, eat of the foods, have your fill. But the conspirators had actually laced these cakes and the wine with enough cyanide supposedly to kill five people. Oh my God. Oh yeah. Now we're gonna begin a very interesting waterfall of me saying something, waiting for a reaction, and then giving you the result. Okay, so on the table in the food, we've got cyanide to kill five. Apparently right. he's eating food. 
Okay, he so doesn't respond to the poison at all. Right. Okay. I was going to say, the first thing's first, this guy dies. Right, right. First thing's first, he dies. That'll be, put a tally in the column, because it's going to happen a few times. Right, he already got stabbed. That's maybe one. This, now two. He's macking on these cakes. He's sucking down some wine. He's eating food, apparently. I, I doubt he's sitting there not eating. Right. But he's eating, mouthful, keeps asking for the princess. Where is she? I want to talk to her. Well, she's gone. And to the point where, like, he didn't respond to the poison, so they just said, well, screw this, and they shot him. Oh, let me guess. They shot him. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a killing blow. Man's still alive. Man survived the shooting Gee. and attempted to escape the palace. <laughs> they found him while he was attempting to escape. They shot him again with a revolver, twice more, following that up with a physical beating. Okay, so he shot three times. He's got s supposedly cyanide in his system. Yes. Shot three times. Mm-hmm. And they're beating the hell out of him. Yes. Now, these brutal attacks, as you can imagine, still did not kill Rasputin. So they bound him and threw him into the Neva River. Jesus. I mean, look, he's a big guy. You can get shot three times. It can hit uh, parts of your body, just, just pure, like, flesh. You, you, you can get scratches. You know what I mean? Like, Imagine he moved so they all hit the same hole. That'd be... Could you imagine? Is it worse to get shot three times in the exact same place? No, right? I guess it would imagine... Like, if it I, was a... a say, say it's, like, top right spot. shoulder. Uh-huh. You just get sh Like, someone points... Like, yippee Kaye kind of thing? Right up on it, and yeah. then just pulls the trigger three times. Well, goodbye shoulder blade, but, I mean... Yeah, but... I don't know enough about the human anatomy to know. Yeah, same. But, like, if I it guess was like a safe spot... Bone, is it worse it shatter the hell out of it? multiple spots, or just one? Right. I like, if I got know. shot my... Is it worse than getting shot in the shoulder the forearm than the leg or is it just blast three times into my upper shoulder it depends on where the first spot is but again with my ignorance <laughs> yeah three same. perfectly timed perfectly placed same spots task right? force task force right? please let us know. task force out there there's a lot of people in the forensics <laughs> there, let yeah, us we, know we, yeah but like i don't know i guess it would just make a bigger hole yeah yeah. Yeah. Well, days later, he swam up on the shore of the. No, I'm just kidding. He did. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was about to say, <laughs> no. Chilean immediately with goes to no take shot, man. Yeah. Well, three shots. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, but but seriously, days later, on January 1st, Rasputin's body was found, and in an autopsy, again, we got to go by history here, but supposedly no poison was found in his blood. The coroner believed that Rasputin was still alive by the time that he was in the water, giving the popular idea that. Rasputin was virtually unkillable. Other sources did say that the opposite was in place. In fact, there are graphic photos out there, I believe. If you go looking around, viewer discretion is advised. But you can see that there is a bullet hole in his forehead. So it's really, this is where I'm saying fact and fiction are jockeying for attention here. Because some believe that there was no water in his lungs and he was fully dead before they chucked him into the river and it was more of a, an oh. anger thing but again it's it's hard to really know now his daughter Rasputin's daughter Maria claimed that her father hated sweets and would not have eaten many cakes like Yusupov had described which could answer why he had not responded to the poison and maybe he had no poison in his system well I mean I guess they put it in the alcohol still yeah here's the thing though if, like if you're gonna poison someone why are you banking on them eating the sweets? Right. Throw it in everything. He's like, I all came for the, dinner. All the food. <laughs> right. right. He's like, he, I only ate the steak and potatoes. Like, if, if, if we were trying to, like, poison someone at dinner, and we had an assortment of food, and you're like, all right, throw it in all the cakes. I'll throw it in all the pastries. I'd right. be like, bro, what if he doesn't do sweets? What if he doesn't have room for dessert? Throw it in everything. Throw it in the steak. Throw it in, like, line it in his silverware. Everything. Like, right. Just, just, Yeah. Especially because if, if you want this person dead so badly, like, yeah. throw it in every single piece of food. Especially, you obviously had enough if it was enough right. to kill five humans. I'm just sitting Why here are thinking, you dumping like, it all into one cake? It, it, it's true. Why? Yeah, you put the whole mix in one bag and you're going, I hope he eats it. Well, they were tea cakes, so. Oh, small little things. Uh, I mean, still. 
Like, yeah. I mean, I'm sure he ate, I don't know, some type of protein dumping into there. Could you imagine he's eating everything but that single cake that they want him to touch? Could you it, imagine them it, sitting there going, he's not touching the cake. Like, so would you like some wine? He goes, absolutely not. And he's like, just starts monging on all of the steaks. He's eating vegetables. He's eating fruits. Going for the meat potatoes. I don't potatoes. know if those were there. Well, he, I'm just <laughs> painting a picture okay. here. Just making sure people know. Yeah, yeah, Yusupov's yeah, yeah. in the back going, he's not eating the cake. And like, yeah. and like, just pull out the gun and go, just shoot the damn guy. Yeah, but but to your point, in a more realistic scenario, it is center. It's kind of like centered around the cake, yeah. right? Like, oh yeah. It isn't actually a full spread at this time. Yes, they invited him over to eat, but it's like wine and cake at this point. Yeah. So there really isn't much else to eat, and so they're like, man, he's not responding. Let's just plan B. Here's a pistol. All right. So bringing us back to reality here. Rasputin's found dead January 1, and following the death of Rasputin, the Tsarina was incredibly upset with Yusupov, yet he wasn't punished and was simply banished to his estate. Kind of like a rich person's house arrest. Damn. You I know? mean, you're a person of power. You get away with a lot of stuff. Yeah. I mean, this would definitely put a dent in any sort of political games that yeah. he was trying to play. But during an uprising in February 1917, Rasputin's body was actually removed from his grave and as the legend goes, when they decided to burn his body, whether it be out of, do you know, Jillian, was it like anger? Was it retaliation? Was it just hatred that they dug him up? They didn't want him to be used as like a symbol yeah. in the war, if that makes sense. Okay. That makes I don't sense. know the term. Like a martyr? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I had no idea that they had dug him up. But while you look that up, they dug him up, they burned him. And the legend says that while he was burning, he sat up. Oh, come on. Like his body sat up. And I'm like, oh, come on. I'm like, is that some sort of like, uh, well, not rigor mortis where you get all. Right, you know, but like, I, I get where you're... Our muscles and tendons. Was his yeah. core tightening? Like, uh, yeah. Did like. Maybe he moved a little snap bit. snap and then like it pulled some parts of his body. Even then, though, like, I just what is his dead corpse going to do versus just the word of mouth and his like tall tail? Right, right. You know? It, it doesn't erase the stories of him, hmm. the image, the thought of. It only of. adds to it, really. Yeah. So while they're trying to prevent him from looking like a symbol or like a some sort of icon. Right. They've just added to the, to the lore. That's you know? what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, they didn't want it to be a monument to the Tsar. Oh, got it. If that. Yes, like, if people... like a physical like monument. So they're yeah. just like, let's just get rid of it. Yeah. The river part didn't work. Let's just burn it. Now. Yeah, they destroyed his tomb, destroyed his body. Yeah. Everything. Okay. That makes a little more sense. Though. Yeah. So that's, you know, Rasputin's end of life. But now it's time to kind of dive into some of the prophecies. Because during his lifetime, he made many predictions of the future. Some have already come to pass, but others, debatably, depending on how you take it, may not have happened yet. This is kind of like, what's his name? Nostradamus, right? Who just kind of made prophecies and a lot of them were so am ambiguous and vague that people are going no they've already passed or no they have yet to pass and you let's know let's do an episode on that. let's do an episode on Nostradamus I'd love that so let's talk about a few of them topically so the death of the Romanovs this one I'll keep short because we'll come back to it but Rasputin believed that the Romanovs would die in some form of tragic way more of this in a second but there's a theme with his predictions that some tragedy is bound to happen did he ever have a positive kind of foresight Jillian? I'm not aware of any. Yeah, your face is saying he was a very, very negative predictor. I mean, like, that's just so vague. Yeah. It's such a blanket, like, prediction. Right. And it's also, I mean, by definition, fear-mongering, you know? Yeah, yeah. What's going to mobilize people more than, than any emotion? Probably fear. Yep. Fear of avoiding a tragedy. Yeah, very true. So let's talk now again about the health of Alexei, because there's a little bit more here. But as I mentioned, Alexei had hemophilia and often experienced episodes of bleeding. And just to go a little bit further for this case, symptoms include nosebleeds, bleeding from the mouth, bleeding into the joints and muscles causing pain, bleeding into the skin and bruising, etc. It's a, it's a really dire scenario, especially for Alexei's severity of his case. But Rasputin would pray for Alexei at the foot of his bed during these episodes and would shoo away any doctors. Now... What's interesting is that we can sit here and think that maybe it was luck, maybe it was some form of mysticism, maybe it was advanced knowledge, but regardless of how you want to take it, the fact is the doctors were actually prescribing Alexei aspirin for most of his cases. 
And we know aspirin now as kind of like an anti-inflammatory pain medicine, right? Yep. So I imagine that maybe they're after the pain side of things, but it turns out that aspirin actually worsens the symptoms of hemophilia. I don't know if it's a severe anticoagulant, because I'm not a doctor, yeah. but suffice to say that it, it's increased the symptoms. And so, again, wh however you want to take it, I leave it to you, but Rasputin telling them to stop traditional medication, while it sounds outlandish, is actually fortuitous in this moment. I'll be honest, I didn't think we were going to get an answer to yeah. how this child got better. Yeah. But again, I can't, I don't I don't think Rasputin knew. I think it I was just that. it just so happened to work out in Rasputin's favor. Yeah. I think there's another element here too because many people claim and I kind of alluded to this earlier, but many people claim that Rasputin must have used hypnosis is a strong word, but some people do believe in that. Some would say otherwise it's just like a commanding voice from an adult to a 3-year-old, mm -hmm. but would maybe use hypnosis on Alexei in order to calm him down, thus kind of lower the heart rate and help alleviate yeah, slightly. Yeah, calm the body. So combining that with the lack of aspirin, he was actually in a better state to recover from his condition. So, I don't know. It's, uh, it's interesting. But now I want to talk about what would happen after his death. So Rasputin actually made a prediction about his own death depending on how he died. He said that if he was killed by accident, the Romanovs would continue to reign, for hundreds of years. And then another one, another time he said, quote, if the murder is committed by nobles, the murder being his murder, and the nobles being relatives of the Tsar, then the future of Russia and the imperial family will be terrible. The nobles will flee the country and the relatives of the Tsar will not be alive in two years. Brothers will rise up against brothers and will kill each other, end quote. He wrote in a later letter to the Tsar that, quote, if it was your relations who have wrought my death, then none of your children will remain alive for more than two years." End quote. And so yes, while he is making predictions of his own life, I also think he's basically saying, if you leave me be and let me die of natural causes, everything will be fine. Yeah. But if whatever you guys do causes me to die, wrath will befall you and you won't make it past two years after my death. I think he's just trying to strike fear. I think so too. However, just like that, only two years after Rasputin's death, the Romanovs were murdered by revolutionaries, specifically in July 1918. So yes, you and I might be sitting here going, he's just fear-mongering to keep himself safe and in power. But the reality is, despite being taken out by literal, like his niece's husband, so literally per his prediction, then the family is all taken out within two years, even the kids. I feel like... It's like seed planting, you know? Right. You plant the seed in someone's head, especially back then during those times, when you go, this is like the prophecy to be foretold. And then it's that seed planted in someone's head, right? They automatically mm -hmm. start thinking in that realm of thought. And so I feel like during those two years, people are like, oh man, this was supposed to happen. It's supposed to happen. And it gets to people who take action. Yeah. And they go, yeah, sure, I'm going to do it. Right. And it's less about the fulfilling the prophecy or whatever. It's more so of just like, um, yeah, I want to do that. Yeah. That seems like something that's a good idea for me to do. Yeah. Or yeah. You and not only that, but like he's probably aware of how the public feels about the Romanovs. Mm -hmm. yeah. He knows that the uprising is stirring. Like, yeah. 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 Or he knows it's afoot. Well, he knows there's <laughs> a lot of political unrest. Yeah. He's definitely trying to take advantage of that. And so, of course, the Romanovs are like, well, whether this is fact or fiction, I am inclined to believe it because I like the results. Mm -hmm. And so then, yeah, it could like impact an educated decisions. prediction. Yes. And also, the same with sowing those seeds of prediction, we as humans tend to look at the ones that come to pass and less so the ones that don't. Right? Yeah. So all the inaccurate ones kind of get forgotten while all the accurate ones go. It's like a survivorship bias thing. Yeah. We happen to see all the ones that were correct. But yeah. Two years later, there go the Romanovs. And though Yusupov and his co-conspirators did not face any repercussions from the Romanovs for the assassination of Rasputin, he did in fact have to flee Russia following the February Revolution in 1918 when the Romanovs were imprisoned. So again, saying other nobles would flee the country also came to pass. And I, But I think you're right. It does feel like someone who, it doesn't matter how humble your beginnings are, you can still 
have the wherewithal to see the political unrest unfold it before you and right. make predictions accordingly. Mm -hmm. And he also just had the ego to center it all around himself. Yeah, I think these were educated predictions. Yeah. Some also think that he predicted the October Revolution because he had said things like, quote, darkness will descend on Petersburg. When the name is changed, then the empire will end, end quote. So St. Petersburg was actually called a different name, Petrograd, during the start of World War I, since the other name sounded too German. In particular, the suffix Berg at the end of Peterburg, in fact, the beginning, Saint or Sankt, these were German words. And so they took the, the Peter part or the Petr part and kind of made a new, new city name out of it. Of course, modernized, it's still called St. Petersburg now, but he kind of said that when the city changes its name, something terrible will happen and the empire will end. And World War I was around then and yeah, the I revolution mean, happened. If you know that it's a, it's a place with unrest, it's a name that's a staple, mm -hmm. maybe. You know what I mean? Well, like, if you also know that the capital has heavy origin in Germanic language and the enemies of the time are Germans, it does feel like an outlandish guess to go, but why would he pick the name changing? But who knows? Maybe it was in, in the air. Maybe people were kind of that's thinking. true. I mean, he was, he he was, was tied in at, like politically yeah. like pretty heavily. Yeah. So if anyone wants to know stuff like that, It'd be him. Yeah, he'd feel it for yeah. sure. But us commoners, we go, whoa, how'd he know? Exactly. They all know. Yeah. Everyone up top yeah. knows. I mean, he's government coming. at this point. Right. Like, right. right. And so obviously, it's like if someone in office was starting to predict all these different things, it's like, well, you're, you're, you're sitting at the table of knowers and the table of influence and doers. Absolutely. Yeah. And the name was changed in 1914. Well, while he was still alive. Or yeah. Student. Oh, okay. And then the October Revolution wasn't until... Four years later? Yeah, or is it 1917? It? I've got... Well, there was the February Revolution in 1918. My bad. Yeah. I don't know the October, October one. October Revolution was... Yeah, probably. 1917. Yes. So it's like... It wasn't like right after. Right. <laughs> yeah, maybe he said that sometime in between. Mm-hmm. But let's talk about global events. Rasputin supposedly predicted global disasters, particularly natural disasters. What? Right. Quote, earthquakes will become more frequent, lands and waters will open, and their damage will engulf people. Another quote, the seas, like thieves, will enter cities into houses and the lands will be drenched with salt. End quote. So some people believe that he predicted the effects of global warming and climate change. I think, whatever you want to believe, but I think that these are fantastic enough sentences to just fit a dime a dozen other predictions that speak to catastrophic natural disasters. These things are agnostic to global warming. These things are cyclical. Things, right, these things just happen. And they happen, you know? So, like, there will be another volcano sometime. A sea will rise for sure. Again, all agnostic to global warming. These things happen. Yeah, it's, it's like, again, blanket predictions. Right. Do you want to make a prediction right now, Fredo? You, I mean, you're the closest to a Nostradamus we've got. <laughs> you're Nostradamus. <laughs> God, no, because yeah, the only thing I should, could, I, I, that comes to mind is terrible things. He, okay, okay, so the inclination to give negative predictions stays with him, but <laughs> but let's do something different. Let's throw out a positive. What does your gut instinct say about a positive future? And don't give a timeline or anything, just throw it out there and we'll see it happen. I guess I'm a glass half empty kind of person because I can't think of a positive thing. And to me, that confirms that you are a soothsayer and you can see the future because... Only negative things come to those who can see. Because we just keep consuming and we just keep taking things for granted. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, it's so bad. <laughs> it's so rough. Nothing's coming your way, man. We're not, Nothing positive we're is not, coming my way. Oh, no. Okay. Well, I'll let, I'll let you... <laughs> I'll let you think on it, because I'm desperate for a positive fortune here. I saw mine! <laughs> but I just keep going down this spiral of negativity! He's like, nope, 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 get off there. Oh, dang it, it's even worse now. Oh, no! <laughs> okay, so I want to leave us with the final, kind of, biggest prediction that people believe he has given. And people believe, that it appears anyway, that he has predicted a third world war. Because he has claimed that three snakes would destroy Europe, and that two have already come to pass. He says this, quote, Three hungry snakes will crawl along the roads of Europe, leaving behind ashes and smoke. They have one house, and this is a sword, and they only have one law, violence. 
But having dragged humanity through the dust and blood, they themselves will perish by the sword. And then there's another quote he has, quote, The time of peace will come, but the world will be written in blood. And when the two fires go out, the third fire will burn the ashes. Few people and few things will survive, but what will remain will have to be subjected to a new purification before entering the earthly paradise. To me, the only wrinkle I can try to offer is that if he's saying that two of these have already kind of passed, he, he was dead long before World War II had come to pass. And when, as it was the Great War, he only saw part of it. And so that's the only angle I can take is that, yeah, you know, you are hitting some threads here, but there weren't, you know... Look, you know what I'm saying? I mean, look, if the predictions are like that, then fine. The the honey pig will glisten in the sun and open like a pinata to flood humanity with positives, positives with um, with relief. Mm. Neutral relief. I could use that. I could use some relief. <laughs> Honestly, I could use some relief. So Jillian, you and I are going to have to keep our eyes out for a glistening pig in the sun. <laughs> Waiting for her to <laughs> gently birth some sweet release onto us Let's humans. just go to a farm, bro. <laughs> just go to a farm, Can we get a 24-7 cam on a farm, please? <laughs> but yes, that is the end of the predictions, the end of the discussion. That is Resputin, leaving us a few questions that I, I want to posit openly to you guys here, but also with the task force. Do you think Resputin cured Alexi? You think he actually had some sort of powers in order to see the future, to know what was going on, to heal people, or do you believe that maybe he was intelligent beyond the credit he was given? Were his predictions real? Was Yusupov's story true? What do you guys think? I think he was a smooth talker. I think from a technical standpoint, yes, he did heal the child. Mm -hmm. Technical standpoint. And no, I don't think he can predict. I think he got... I think he really like bulldoze his way down the path that was kind of being created around him mm. and so from there he just fancified his thoughts and projected them out to people as predictions and whatnot and so that's to, to mystify others yeah regardless though very interesting person very interesting person and that's again why we wanted to do these mysterious individuals this month because you know Going into this, and thank you, Jillian, for all the incredible research. I get to finally thank you in the episode here in person. You're welcome. But to me, like, when we had talked about doing this month, Rasputin immediately came to mind because I'm like, I know a few things. Like, I know that he's got this, like, this presence about him and, like, a lot of people kind of know his name but don't really know who he really was or what even the legends say of him. And it's so interesting. Again, I love doing that in this show where you combine what these fantastic stories are saying combined with reality and you can attempt to find maybe what you feel confident is the the actual truth but again there's just not enough documentation to fully find it yeah i mean it's a it's a shift in pace task force let us know what you think you can always let us know by hitting us up on social at red web pod or uh, we're trying to get back on tiktok i know i keep promising this but at the red web on tiktok where we're going to try to do some bite-sized mysteries and things like that you can send me an email you can send jillian an email <laughs> redweb at roostersheath.com or simply those five stars those thumbs up all those ways that you guys share us with your friends and other new task force members it's it's incredible to see so thank you all so much for engaging with us and hanging with us every single week but speaking of fredo we got two more mysterious people to come back to we got a couple more mysterious people oh man with that said, Fredo, I'll see you right back here next Monday for yet another mysterious person. So many mysterious people we could be talking about. Shaquille O'Neal. Shakira. Sh Chicago. Chicago. <laughs> we'll see. Shyamalan, I'm not Shyamalan. <laughs> I'm not Shyamalan yet. Very mysterious. Very mysterious.